Thank you all, and, and uh, I want to give special thanks to Nick Meyer, who's um, sponsored my talk. Uh, this kind of event would not be possible without the generosity of everyone who has, um, has given so much to the Institute. Uh, my talk is called Land Agronomy and State, and uh, I want to talk about my time in the Soil Conservation Service, um, which is one of those agencies people don't think about very much. Um, you might have seen a sign. I saw one, I think, at the county line when I was driving here um, that said something like, you're now entering uh, the uh, Soil and Water Conservation District or uh, Jasper County or something like that. And we, we know, don't we, um, how much better it is when a federal initiative is divided up into districts like the Federal Reserve <laughs> districts, right? Doesn't that make it so much better? The um, summer before I started at Clemson University as an undergraduate, I was 17 years old, and a friend who worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Soil Conservation Service, which is now renamed the Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, helped me get a job in the agency's regional engineering office in Florence, South Carolina. And at the time, I had plans to study engineering. It was a good fit. And the service provides mainly technical assistance to agricultural operations. So I started reclaiming taxpayer dollars uh, that summer and for three subsequent summers in between semesters at college. Most of my time was spent working on a survey crew. Uh, so for four summers, I was hacking at brush with a machete in the humid South Carolina low country clearing lines of sight for uh, uh, surveyors. Other days I spent hovering over a drafting table helping to design drainage ditches or catfish ponds or other uh, uh, agricultural operations like waste collection basins for livestock, which is lovely. Um, some days I worked with a state geologist um, using muscle power to turn an auger to take soil samples to see if we had enough clay in the soil to make a, an earthen dam. Um, the work wasn't glamorous, um, but I'm glad I did it for two main reasons, one of which is that it gave me a lifelong appreciation for what millions of Americans do every day um, outside of offices, before I descended into a career in offices and classrooms. Um, second, it was an unforgettable education in the workings of the federal government. Nothing we did in the engineering office was beyond the capability of the private sector. In fact, we were essentially competing with the private engineering firms on an unequal footing. While a level playing field is often used to justify government intervention, our office operated on tax dollars. We didn't pay taxes like private engineering firms do and we enjoyed other advantages. Uh, so we were tilting the field against private businesses. The lack of a profit incentive meant that inefficiencies persisted that would not usually be tolerated in the private sector. Uh, on several occasions, I would be assigned to work with someone in an adjacent office um, whose service to the taxpayers apparently consisted of driving around in his government pickup truck, visiting his friends in the local tobacco auction warehouse, and taking frequent breaks from his token efforts at completing land surveys. Uh, I was told that firing him for doing nothing was not easy to do. The government provided me with a uh, small pickup truck to drive around various project sites. Um, I probably got thousands of miles on this little truck over a couple of months before I thought to check the oil. Um, it was low with little metallic specks. <laughs> Not good. Um, I had assumed that someone in the office would be responsible for maintenance, um, or at least would tell me that I was responsible for maintenance. Um, a staffer at the office in a neighboring county said that one of the employees there had driven a truck with the uh, until the oil dipstick came up dry, which is not good. Somehow the engine had not seized yet. So I, I took away from this that you know, government does not take care of the things that taxpayers um, uh, 
involuntarily buy for them. Most inefficiencies, however, were difficult to see from even inside the agency. Um, the people who benefited from a drainage ditch or an agricultural design or an earthen dam certainly thought of what we were doing as beneficial. Um, but behind every one of our projects stood taxpayers with their own goals that would go unrealized because their resources had been confiscated by the government to fund our projects. This gets to Frederick Bastiat's um, insightful discussion of what is seen and what is not seen. While our design services certainly provided someone with a useful um, product, there was no way to be sure that the benefits exceeded the costs. Using tax dollars for our projects meant that we lacked any price information that would help us compare the, the two. We were facing Mises' socialist calculation problem. We had no way to know that the value of the projects was greater than the value that was lost by the taxpayers because the people benefiting from the projects did not have to bid the resources away from those who would be providing those resources. Uh, the resources were simply confiscated. Um, in, in, in a market economy, entrepreneurs who want to start a project must get the resources by enticing those who have the resources currently to hand them over uh, by, by payment. Um, and so the, that, that trade, that is only going to take place if the entrepreneur's assessment of the value of those resources is greater than the current resource owner's assessment of the value in their current use. So because the state can simply seize resources, um, it's likely that the value of the soil conservation services uh, projects was less than the value in their alternative private sector uses. And for more on this, I would strongly recommend, um, at least uh, uh, on this point, chapter three of Per Bylan's great new book, The Seen, the Unseen, and the Unrealized. I encourage you to read the whole book. I'm using uh, his book in one of my classes on regulation, and it, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, once the projects that we were doing were decided upon, there remained the problem of deciding on the best production process. Uh, for every goal, there were, were several possible paths to that goal, which one was the most efficient. For mapping a field, uh, we could use old plain table survey equipment that was um, you know, many, many years old, or we could use a high-tech total station device that was probably $10,000, um, along with a computer and the special printer and all of this kind of thing, uh, used as a, a laser to generate a, a map, which especially in the mid-1990s was, was pretty amazing. Um, the older equipment probably was no more than a few hundred dollars, and, and it did require different skills from the surveyors than the total station device did. Was it better to do, do the job more quickly, um, but maybe more expensively with the total station device, the kind of capital intensive method, or was it better to take a few extra days and use the more labor intensive process? Well, there's no free market pricing mechanism to indicate the value that the customers place on this, on this, um, on this process. We don't really know. Um, and so the Soil Conservation Service ended up having to just guess as, as to what was best. What did actually save us from worse errors in the choice of production processes was ironically the private sector. Uh, we could easily observe what private sector engineering offices were choosing to do as they did their surveys, and we could infer those are probably close to what we, we needed. The Soviet Union more or less pulled this off for the better part of a century for an entire economy uh, by observing prices and production processes in the more free market economies. They could find approximate solutions for their own economy, even though, as uh, we know, that that was horribly uh, insufficient. Um, and, and Soviet economic growth was, was stunted. The infor information mooching that they engaged in eventually caught up with them. Um, I, I strongly recommend um, uh, a book by E.C. Passore um, 
on this called Agriculture in the State. It's an older book, but it's got some great insights on some of this if you're interested in, in the state intervention in agriculture in general. And he obliterates some of the common arguments for federal soil conservation programs. He reminds us that farming is an entrepreneurial endeavor. He said, conservation involves capital investment and the conservation problem is one of choosing among alternative patterns of resource use over time, setting the most uh, profitable rate of resource use is an entrepreneurial decision and is necessarily based on a subjective assessment of uncertain future conditions. Whether it is economic to conserve energy by insulating the walls of a house, for example, depends on, on heating costs over time and insulation costs, both of which are uncertain. And later he says, the success of U.S. agriculture over time is evidence that farmers are knowledgeable and competent entrepreneurs. The increasing productivity of cropland per acre in the United States suggests that farmers do not lose their entrepreneurial ability in investment decisions about soil resources. In contrast, government is politically driven incompetency. Uh, Passour said, a national conservation program is likely to be a model of inefficiency. Soil erosion that is economically important occurs on particular farms in specific locations and it is a small percentage of the total amount of land in crops, pasture, range, and forests is affected, yet the SCS provides funds and services to all parts of U.S. agriculture. Why does the SCS spend funds in counties with few, if any, erosion problems? These decisions are basically dictated by political rather than economic considerations. Members of Congress have an incentive to provide jobs and federal spending in their own legislative districts, regardless of whether such expenditures are economic. Now, some people have argued that there is a legitimate role for an agency like the National Resources Conservation Service, and one of those is based on this uh, ver a version of this public goods um, argument. And the argument is, well, maybe the, maybe the research and information about soil conservation is something that is a good that the agency can provide. Uh, once created, the information can then be distributed at low cost to everyone. And some people have argued that sustainable agriculture or forests might be public goods. But um, there, there's some, as you might guess, some pretty serious problems with this. One of these is that the information can be dead wrong. For example, Soil Conservation Service research in the late 1970s and early 1980s led to an unfounded scare about vanishing farmland. You actually still hear this today. You know, we don't have as much farmland, therefore, you know, no farms, no food. You, hear, you see these bumper stickers and that kind of, that's about the level of the thinking here. Um, remarkably, the, the agency acknowledged in 1984 that they had goofed badly and retracted their earlier statements. I mean, this is, take note, because that doesn't happen very much with a federal agency. Um, they had stated that 64.7 million acres were urban and built up land in 1977, but then in 1982 said, well, it was actually only 46.6 million, and a little quick math indicates that that's an error of around 50%. Um, a couple of years later, they made another confession um, in contrast to the earlier fear-mongering about worsening soil erosion, soil erosion was actually lessening. Furthermore, research and information are not unqualified goods. Often government agencies make mistakes and foist a project on us that does more harm than good. In the South, one does not have to go far to see evidence of one of the more pervasive and persistent errors of the Soil Conservation Service. Kudzu. Kudzu was initially imported from Japan in 1876 for a Philadelphia gardening exposition, but received a less than enthusiastic response. Uh, it didn't become the plague of the southern countryside until the mid-1930s when the Soil Conservation Service grew 70 million kudzu seedlings and began paying farmers $8 an acre to plant it in erosion-prone areas. It rooted very well in eroding soil and then fanned out from gullies and fields to cover anything in its path. 
trees, fences, utility poles, buildings, and some say slow-moving livestock. <laughs> Kudzu grew to cover an estimated 7 million acres in the southeast, an area about one-third the size of this state. Eventually, the Department of Agriculture recognized that they had perhaps chosen a cure that was worse than the disease and took kudzu off the acceptable ground cover list. Well, that's a start. By 1970, the government realized that it had nurtured a monster and called it a bad weed. And then in 1997, kudzu was placed on the federal noxious weed list. The whole erosion concern that was behind the creation of the Soil Erosion Service in the 1930s and then the Soil Conservation Service was itself in part the product of government. The Homestead Act limited land claims to 160 to 320 acres when the Great Plains were settled, but economists have noted that this small size contributed to farming techniques that led to the erosion of the Dust Bowl period. Depression era conservation programs such as the one that gave us kudzu were at least partially aimed at reducing the amount of productive cropland, but the Soil Conservation Service nicely dovetailed with the Roosevelt administration's plan to bail out farmers by raising the prices of crops. And this legacy continues. There are programs I won't go into here, uh, uh, Conservation Reserve Program and, and others that Basically, the effort is to reduce the amount of land that is farmed, driving up crop prices and supposedly helping farmers. We know that soil conservation has never been the exclusive domain, domain of government. We've had you know, crop terracing for millennia. Um, historically, the private sector has done a far better job. We can see examples like the railroad magnate James J. Hill, who paid agronomists to do soil studies along the route of the Great Northern Railroad and promulgated all of this research for free to farmers, uh, paid farmers to, um, to do things that were beneficial in, in, um, federal, in, in conservation. Whereas the federal conservation efforts um, were criticized by Hill as being um, a, a slow, cumbrous, and costly, as he said. If you would like, I can point you to a recent example of some of that cumbrous NRCS uh, bureaucracy at work persecuting an Indiana farm family for allegedly destroying a wetland, a wetland which never existed. Uh, I don't have time to share the details now, but I'll email it to you if you're, if you're interested. The contributions of people like James Hill have been almost totally forgotten. Instead, we tend to trust in government to save us from erosion and wetlands destruction. This has resulted in immense damage. Um, some of those harms are highly visible. Other costs, like the foregone projects of countless taxpayers, uh, remain unseen. Uh, yet this is the legacy of government bureaucracies like the National Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, they start out with an apparently benign purpose, expand vigorously and indiscriminately, take over all resources within their reach, and choke out their competition. It seems fitting that they should be associated with kudzu. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>